Hello all, and welcome back to my Dark Seed 2 guide read. The guide, of course, is by Leanne Morris. Today's episode is going to cover Chapter 10, The Evidence Mounts. Just a reminder, like the last video, I'm adding my logo as a visual indicator for when I go off script. Let's get started. Never one to argue with a smart chick. Mike wastes no time in getting to the normal world and heading over to the Civic Center. The quote-unquote government leader, of whom the Keeper of the Scrolls spoke, drives up as Mike approaches. It's Mayor Fleming, Melissa's husband and Mr. Dawson's former business partner. He leaves his car by the curb as Mike introduces himself. The Case Against Mayor Fleming Mayor Fleming has heard all about Mike's mental trouble and says, The missus and I have been meaning to ask you and your mother over for dinner. Wouldn't that be a cozy meal? even if the Flemings weren't having, uh, problems. Fleming displays a tasteful nudge-nudge attitude about his May-December marriage. He's equally upfront about the glamour of the mayor's job. The insurance business was full of lies and manipulation, but now he has ideals, principles, and integrity. I mean, if you say so. Pretty sure politics is fraught with lies and manipulation as well. Anywho... He claims to have known Rita only slightly. She did some research for his re-election campaign. Coincidentally, some money seems to be missing from his campaign fund. In fact, that's why he's at the courthouse. He wants to discuss the shortfall with his staff. Mike has made him late, and he doesn't even have time to grab the briefcase that he left in his locked car. He leaves abruptly. Mike noticed that Mayor Fleming turned pale when he brought up the murder. He obviously knows, or suspects, more than he's letting on. Maybe it's time to add a little breaking and entering to Mike's list of accomplishments. After all, if he's caught, he can always plead insanity. A quick hanger to the car door's lock mechanism, and Mike's in. The briefcase reveals a quarter and a picture of Rita dressed in leather with whip accessories. Mike is furious at the mayor, and he believes that Rita must have been coerced into a relationship with Fleming. The Case Against Doc Larson A second stop into the morgue doesn't reveal anything new. The normal world Keeper of Light, Lighthouse Attendant Mark Danson, is still on the slab and is getting a little ripe. Doc Larson is nowhere in sight, but Mike already has evidence that gives the medical examiner a motive for murder. The little black book links him to just about every loose girl in town. And Jimmy has already admitted that he procured women for Doc Larson's pleasure. There was also the invitation to speak before the AMA, an organization stuffy enough to cancel if Larson's on-the-job and extracurricular activities come to light. The case against Sheriff Butler. Now that Mike has a quarter, he can finally use the payphone to get Sheriff Butler out of his office. And in case you didn't realize, you needed to get Sheriff Butler out of his office. One of the dialogue choices, along with opportunities to call Mrs. Dawson, 911, Dr. Sims, or Rita's house, is, maybe I can get the sheriff out of his office. When the sheriff answers, Mike can either tell him about a car accident on Highway 71, a robbery in progress, or an attempt on Mike's life. But the highway patrol handles events outside of town, and Crowley, recent events to the contrary, is still a sleepy berg. The sheriff thinks the murder attempt is a crank call. Go the middle ground and report a robbery. Either robbery choice, old lady attacked at ATM, or hold up at the dairy freeze, will result in the sheriff putting his girly magazine aside and earning his paycheck. Even after he's in the sheriff's office, Mike's still unable to get inside the locked file cabinet. But who needs files when the sheriff leaves his incriminating evidence in his unlocked desk? Mike finds a framed picture of Rita. Only the glass has been smashed, as if by a fist. The sheriff wasn't as unconcerned about their breakup as he indicated, and a clipping from a Dallas newspaper reports Sheriff Butler's indictment for graft. The evidence gives the sheriff a possible motive for killing Jimmy, who knows about the bribery charge, but not for Rita. His reputation and job are more important to him than some floozy. Just to check things out, Mike stops in to see Jimmy. He asks the thug once again why he was hanging around Rita's house the night she died. Jimmy claims he was there on business, but Rita never showed up. He doesn't add anything about Sheriff Butler. On his way to show Jack the evidence he's compiled, 
Mike stops by Hank's only to find out that the health department has shut down the diner. Evidently, there was an unexpected rat invasion. The case according to Pandora and Jack. Mike needs to show Jack the evidence and see what his friend has to say. But he also needs an impartial viewpoint. And who better than the normal world counterpart to the Keeper of the Scrolls? Pandora may not speak plain English, but her instincts are right on track. And as long as Mike's already at the carnival, he goes around to the Wheel of Fortune on the Midway to see if his Dark World rigging with the magnet did any good. Ta-da! Using the Dark World Wheel Machine selection of six, Mike wins a plush teddy bear for his inventory. Pandora and Lucy don't seem to have moved since Mike's first readings. Some of her fortunes haven't changed either. She has nothing new to report about the clown or Gargan. For Minnie and Daisy, she now sees a glass house with three hallways, one full of twists and turns, a second behind a locked door, and the third behind a secret door. This house also casts a shadow into the night. When Mike tells her that this is the strangest carnival he's ever seen, and isn't that an understatement, she gives him hints about winning the Midway Games. She sees a smile placed onto a dark circle, pin lips speak a lucky number. A blacksmith making a mountain out of a molehill, and aiming up so you can actually get the ring over the pole. (laughs) Sorry, that's not what it says. And an ailing Cupid whose generosity wins a game of horseshoes. Again, (laughs) just aim a little higher. (laughs) As for the other new items in Mike's inventory, she foretells. For the Wheel of Fortune teddy bear, I see a butterfly turning into a caterpillar, wearing sunglasses attached with a safety pin. Sheriff Butler's newspaper and photo. I see a dog barking at a barren tree. For Fleming's photos. I see a hat rack with two of its four pegs occupied. And for the glass key. I see a door that is much too far from the finish line. Jack's impressions are a little more straightforward than Pandora's. The bribery charge against Sheriff Butler doesn't surprise him, and he guesses that the lawman still carries a torch for Rita. He had already told Mike that Mayor Fleming was different from his grandfatherly image, but he knows Mike must have wanted to kill the mayor when he saw those pictures. The only unusual thing about Doc Larson's little black book is that he can attract babes after poking around dead bodies all day. Both Mike and Jack agree that none of the evidence Mike's found is conclusive. Jack wants to take Sheriff Butler off the suspect list, but Mayor Fleming could have been protecting his re-election chances. And besides, he's the one bringing in his FBI buddies to investigate. Doc Larson needed a reputation and money if he was to finish his research and get that university position that he craved. The one bone of contention between the two friends is Jack's unwillingness to add Mrs. Ramirez to the suspect list. Her husband was seen with Rita just before he died, but she seemed a lot more merry widow than jealous wife. The insurance money probably did a lot to soothe that green monster. The case against Mrs. Ramirez. Even though Jack tells Mike not to bother with Mrs. Ramirez, he decides it's best to err on the side of caution. And his diligence pays off when, as he's approaching the Ramirez mansion, Mike sees Jimmy approaching. The thug knocks on the door and announces that he's there to collect his final payment. Mrs. Ramirez hustles him out of view, and the two go into the living room with the open window. Mike eavesdrops. Come on, lady! You still owe me one last payment for the torch job! Fork it over! You need to learn that patience is a virtue, young man. The money's been coming in slow from the insurance company, that's all. Here's the rest of what I owe you. Bless you for your help. When he sees Mrs. Ramirez hand Jimmy a wad of cash, Mike whips out his camera and takes a picture of the two. Caught in the act. If Rita suspected the pair's plot, they wouldn't hesitate in adding another murder to their tally. And that's the end of chapter 10. So in this chapter, Mike handed over the evidence, the mayor's photos, the sheriff's newspaper, and photo, and Doc Larson's little black book, to Jack. He used the quarter and hanger, and new to the inventory is the teddy bear he won from the Wheel of Fortune, and he also met Mayor Fleming. So let me go back to the beginning. 
All right, first picture here is of Mayor Fleming. Mayor Fleming is a beloved politician, but he turns pale when Mike mentions Rita. All right, next one's with his car. Mike turns up some damning evidence when he breaks into Mayor Fleming's car. <laughs> yes, yes, he does. Also, looking at this picture here, the car looks just like so <laughs> superimposed on that photo. <laughs> it's like sticking out in the middle of the street. What the hell is the mayor thinking? All right, um, in the sheriff's office. Mike can't search the sheriff's office while the sheriff is there. So provide a distraction with a well-placed phone call. <laughs> okay. All right, uh, Pandora. Pandora's impressions of the items in Mike's inventory can prove invaluable. Like, I get what she means by impressions, but I feel every time I read it, I feel like the, she means the characters are doing impressions of the other characters. Oh, God, sorry. It's stupid. Uh, and the last picture is of Mrs. Ramirez. Mike uses the final shot on his film to catch a picture of Jimmy counting the money Mrs. Ramirez paid him to kill her husband. And that's it. That was actually a pretty short chapter. Let me see, is 11 longer? It definitely looks longer, Jesus. Oh my God. In any case, <laughs> that was chapter 10, not 11. <laughs> um, uh, hope you enjoyed this reading. <laughs> As always, thank you for watching. Hey y'all, a beta version demo of my game, Tales of Hyperia the Crimson Knight, is available to play over at my itch.io page. The link is down in the description. The final demo version is set to release by the end of the year, and will see massive improvements and upscaling. Make sure you stay tuned for updates.